The professor is in. Hey there, today I have an unboxing video and in this video I'm going to open up my second order that I placed with Professor's Comics on Atomic Avenue. Um, I'll put a link here to my first unboxing video uh, where I featured uh, Professor's Comics and kind of the backstory there. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a heartwarming story and I had such good experience, had good feelings about the, the first order that I placed a second order. And uh, his brother, uh, who's handling his collection, uh, shipped this order out like, I swear it was like the same day. It came priority mail three day, uh, and it arrived today. Um, and I've got some great books in here that I can't wait to take a look at and grade and add to my collection. Now, uh, I threw up some books here, and these are newer books, some newer releases, and it, it's... I, I on a daily basis have this struggle with comic book collecting where I tell myself, you have enough back issues, you don't need any more, they are what they are, you have what you have, uh, you have way more back issues that you need to press and clean and send for grading, so just focus on new releases, enjoy them, read them, collect them, um, don't stress too much about them, try not to FOMO even though you kind of do, and then that leads me towards why I don't want to collect new books, which is the FOMO piece, and uh, no matter how many books I pre-order, no matter how many books I get on New Comic Book Day, there always seems to be that one book floating out there. Uh, it, Captain Carter, number one, the second print. Uh, these late printings uh, continue just to haunt me. I didn't get that one, so that's a new release, and, and then I didn't pre-order it and I missed out. Uh, Grim number one, second print, is the latest that can't be found anywhere. Uh, I did pre-order a bunch of Grimm number one, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting those out of my pre-orders, uh, but didn't order the second print, and then I just sort of kicked myself, and what it does to me over time is it, it sort of sours my interest on new releases, where I can't just collect and read the new stories, because there's always that one book that... People are overhyping and overpushing and, and underloving or overloving. And it just like, I just wonder like, what are we doing? And, and they're, today's modern flipper, seller, uh, online auction streaming person, they, their whole motivation is around flipping these books. So they want to get a book for three bucks and they want to convince you that it's worth a hundred the next day. And that whole game that is such a turnoff for me as a collector, I would much rather maybe spend $20 on a book that I know is worth a hundred or has the potential to be if I can press it or if um, it's maybe overlooked by a, a retailer of some kind. I don't know what it is. It certainly could be my age or just the time that I've spent in the hobby and my experience where I just, I can't keep up. I, I can't keep up with it. Um, there's too much sort of back channel chatter to where uh, we're going to all figure out together collectively, which book are we going to prop up? So I'm going to buy 50 copies, and then we're going to decide this is the book that we're going to push out there and say to the community, this is the one that's valuable. Um, I go back and forth where I'm like, I want to play the game. I want to be involved. But then I love back issues too much and the nostalgia and I don't know, it's just, it's something like buying what you know uh, and, and I'm, I'm constantly conflicted and honestly I can't really decide and stick to one method or another. Uh, there's part of me that just enjoys kind of flip-flopping too. I, I enjoy uh, getting a box of new releases, uh, maybe my FOC order that comes in and I love seeing just brand new, new artwork, new stories, new characters. Uh, it, it certainly adds a lot of freshness to the hobby and freshness to my collection. And then I'll go a couple of weeks and I'll 
totally be into new books, and then I just start to miss those older books. Uh, miss I miss the newsprint. I, I miss the the collectability. Um, I miss the smell. <laughs> Whatever it is about the older books, I'm just constantly pulled in both directions. Uh, so you'll see this in, in my unboxing videos where I'm unboxing uh, newer releases or relatively new releases, and then I'll have an order like this that I'm about to open that is all just back issues, books I love, uh, books that I feel like have potential value. I wanted to um, also just add an additional set of books from Professor's Comics, uh, grade the books, add them to my collection, and then uh, put together you know a larger sample size of what it means to order books from him because I do track orders from uh, different sites, different sellers, different platforms, and then I sort of rank those sellers or rank the stores against each other to figure out you know which which are those reliable sellers that I can get great books from, high condition, fast shipping, and so forth. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, unbox this order, and then if you stay till the end, I'll show you what I paid for these books, and we can see how I did, and compare what I paid for these books against fair market value, and if I were to get the books graded. So here we go. All right, here's the order from Professor's Comics. Let's go ahead and open it up. Okay, believe me, you will not find anything more riveting than watching me peel tape off of uh, cardboard boxes and bags of comic books. That was amazing. Um, also, um, one of the books uh, left a note, couldn't find uh, one of them, so sent me $3 cash. So I'm already $3 richer. Uh, so I will have to make an adjustment to my order details, and that's fine. Um, so, got a little refund. I'll put that aside. And let's start going through the comics, and let's see what I got. All right. In whatever order... <laughs> there's... I. It's funny. Like, I find scotch tape all over the place, and... Uh, just It never fails. Um, it always gets me. Always gets me. All right, I'm gonna replace all these anyway, so I'm just gonna leave the tape on there. Uh, this is Daredevil 101. Uh, this I actually purchased in, I believe it was VF uh, condition, so not near mint, uh, but uh, this is the first full and cover appearance of Angar the Screamer, and just felt like uh, that character, the name of that character just spoke to me for some reason, uh, Angar the Screamer. This whole run where Daredevil uh, teams up with Black Widow is, is uh, interesting. Uh, and 20 cent cover, uh, really good price on it, I thought, at, at the time anyway. Um, and wanted to go ahead and grab this one. I'm going to get the rest of the tape off of here. And we'll move on to the next book. So speaking of Daredevil and Black Widow, 
Uh, here is Daredevil 188. Uh, this is uh, cover art by Frank Miller. Uh, I love this cover. This is a super tough book to get in a 9.8. Um, I don't see a lot of spine wear, and this one I've been on the, the hunt for. Um, I'm just looking at what, what the prices were at 4.49. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, anyway, let me open this up and let's take a look at the condition of this one. So the spine looks really nice. Really, really nice. There are a few ticks here just on the edge. Right there you can see in the light. Um, but they're not... Well, now if you zoom in, just slightly color breaking. But not bad. Uh, corners are in good shape. Um, all of these books need a press of some kind. Like, it you start to see just a little bit of, of wrinkling, maybe, just at the very, very top. Again, I'm, I'm being nitpicky. Right in the light there, you can kind of see as I'm moving it back and forth above comics. It, just a little bit. You know, again, that's where you're looking at a 9.6, and then you just kind of work backwards. A little bit of a... A little bit of a fold there on that corner, and then you're like, okay, maybe 9.4... You've got the spine ticks potentially, definitely uh, justifying the 9.4 grade so far. And if we turn it over, um, when I see a book like this and it, it has some dirt, I already take it down a grade, and then depending on just how much. So I see that and I think 9.2, I see that and I think 9, and then I see some more down there and I think 8.5. Um, but has a lot of potential for improvement. Um, I'd have to look at, look at it a little bit more closely. This corner alone might prevent it from being a 9.8 someday, so it could max out at 9.6, but uh, a really nice copy otherwise. And like I said, these books from Professor's Comics, they all need a little bit of love and, and, and CPR, uh, so I don't I don't mind that. I know when I'm going in, that's what I'm dealing with. But this is a really strong 8.5. Um, and again, uh, a really nice book to work on. Uh, and I notice too, as I angle it, there's also a crease here. I don't think that's really taking it down any further to an 8 or a 7.5. I think it's going to sit nicely at an 8.5. Um, it's going to get pressed anyway. So hopefully that, um, that crease at the top comes out. So this... This looks like a, a really, really nice, as it turns out, a nice pickup. Um, and again, what I'm looking for is the potential for books like this uh, to be professionally graded in a 9.4 or above. Um, and so this really fits the bill with a little bit of cleanup. Um, I think I can definitely get it into that 9.4 range. All right, so I'll go ahead and mark on the back of the board 8.5. And then I indicate a CP for clean and press. And then I can keep track in my collection which books not only do I need to work on and which books need a certain type of work. You know, is it a quick press, uh, humidity chamber, clean and press? I, I try and uh, add that designation so I kind of know what I'm dealing with. Uh, and I know how much time I have and so forth when I'm ready to work on books. And then also what I do is in my collection ledger, uh, I like to see which books would, from a value perspective, benefit from my time. Uh, this one I know already would greatly benefit. I can see a lot of potential here. Um, and again, because of this cover... Uh, itself, it it just attracts, it's, it's a defect magnet, essentially, like a lot of these books are. So enough about this one, Daredevil 188, love it. Uh, lots of potential from the condition perspective on that one. And then the issue right after it, Daredevil 189. Uh, this is the uh, spoiler alert, Death of Stick. Uh, I watched the... Uh, well, I watched the first two seasons, and I'm halfway through the third season of Daredevil. Um, I watched the first season on Netflix, and then when it came to Disney+, Plus, I watched the full second season, and now I'm in the middle of season three. Um, Stick is a major character in seasons one and two. 
Um, he has yet to make an appearance in three. Uh, say what you will about season two. Season two was really out there. But I thought that all of the, the actors that were involved in season two did a fantastic job with the material that they had. I loved Elektra. I loved her character. Um, I thought Stick was great. So I'm really... This one sort of caught my eye. Uh, again, we're talking uh, the age of, of Frank Miller, Daredevil, uh, but also uh, you've got the hand involved. You have Stick, Elektra, Bullseye, all of this. This is just a great time to be a Daredevil fan and collector. Um, I did not have this book. Um, would love to get this as a CGC Signature Series book someday. I love the, the yellow on the cover there. So again, just at first glance, um, Spine looks to be in tremendous shape. So I won't grade this one, but you can just kind of see at a glance. Um, is it a proper 9.4 just right out of the gate on its own? Probably not. There's, these books are older. Um, they just need a little bit of attention, but really, really great uh, pressing candidates here. Uh, we've got one back-to-back, -back, so I'll start with this one, Fantastic Four 274. This is uh, uh, written and penciled and inked, I think, by John Byrne. Um, and he did the cover on this one as well. Uh, not my favorite John Byrne cover. Uh, I, I got it. It's thing. It's, he's coming through the wall or whatever. I, I get it. Um, it, it's John Byrne, Fantastic Four. Uh, I didn't have this issue. So this is a, this is me still trying to fill out the John Byrne run of Fantastic Four. Um, you kind of have to find your own keys, your own books that you target. If you can't get the first appearance of Galactus, the first appearance of Silver Surfer, uh, all of the Fantastic Four number one, all of those great Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, early Fantastic Four books, um, then pick a different era. And uh, the John Byrne Fantastic Four era is one that I'm actively pursuing and didn't have this one. So um, happy to add this one regardless of what thing is doing in that cover. On the back side, uh, this one, I do have a couple of copies, so I'm happy to add another one. Fantastic Four 273. This is the first full appearance of Nathaniel Richards. Uh, he has ties to Kang. Um, it's like, Father, you're the warlord. Um, if only my kids spoke to me that way, I'd be a, a, a proud father. Again, John Byrne here doing the art and story, uh, and anything related to Kang... Uh, Loki on Disney Plus and all of that stuff. This book heated up during the Loki TV show and then cooled off, but I still think it's going to be uh, not a super important book uh, once Kang returns to whatever MCU property he shows up in next. Uh, but I just think it's a, it's a great book when you're talking about multiverse, uh, all of the iterations of Kang, his backstory, his origin, and so forth. So um, I keep seeing this book and I see it uh, dropping in value and I'm scooping this one up. Black Panther number seven, Jack Kirby on art with this. Uh, this is the first appearance of Bashenga, the first Black Panther. Uh, I think that this Black Panther solo series done by Kirby, uh, sort of the first solo T'Challa storyline, the whole thing. Um, I, th I love it. Uh, I, I love picking up these books. And again, kind of back to my sort of opening argument around new books and old books, like when I can get a book like this for 20 bucks and it be in the condition that it's in, which by the way, um, it's miswrapped. Uh, so a knock against it there, but it looks really nice looks really really nice in fact i am going to open this one up and just take a look uh if you if you've got 20 dollars to spend you know are you going for that that modern new release book that is a second print and are you really going to get 100 bucks for it or are you going to get a book like this now here's the difference between a book in in the bag and board and then out as soon as i took this book out you can start to see yeah, there you go. So there's all your spine ticks. Now, what I uh, I didn't notice them breaking any color, and I don't think that they are. I think they're just crease. I think they're just creases up and down the spine. So that's good news. Um, 
And again, this is the gamble here because on a certain type of photo or online scan, this might look to be in a certain condition. You might see that and think, oh yeah, that's a, that's a seven or an eight. But honestly, and then you change it like that out of the light and it looks perfect. Um, it's not breaking color. Um, any, anything that looks like a color break, that's just picking up my light. Um, wonderful. Uh, the back doesn't look too dirty. Just again, some mild creasing. So I'm super excited about this one. A um, couple of creases in here. So I would just sort of blast uh, the spine and the front with some humidity and get that in the press. Um, I don't think, maybe I give it just a light cleaning, but it's it's pretty vibrant. Um, again, just some, some basic, uh, I'd say basic spine ticks that you'd expect for the age of this book from 1977. Uh, white pages here got that great Kirby art you've got T'Challa on his own his own story uh super cool love it so I I love this <laughs> these are the books that I love um I love it so now what grade would I give it on its own probably a nine nine two I mean the corners look amazing uh again you got just a little bit of uh just like the other book just some not quite finger bends up there, just a little bit of just a little bit of wear at the top, but though that's those are all pressable. Uh, same thing on the bottom, right in there, right there, there I caught it on the light. Right there, there's a little bit again. That's very pressable. Doesn't break color. And speaking of, I mean that, I, I'm super excited about this one because this one I think even more so than. Well, I'm pretty excited about the Daredevil book too, but um, this looks tremendous. So it's white pages. It it has such a great color scheme. Jack Kirby art, Black Panther just coming right. He's like jumping off the cover. Um, I think I would just go ahead and give it a nine uh, and leave it at that. I've got a 9.0 that I always talk about as my guide and it's got like about half a dozen spine ticks and a little bit of corner softening and a little bit of creasing on the back. And to me, that's sort of like your standard nine. Um, so I think giving this one a nine with the amount of creases it has is fair. Um, but without the color breaks, uh, I'm really, really excited about working on this book. So I'm gonna put it as a nine and I'm, I, I'm kind of on the fence as far as whether it needs cleaning. Um, I mean, there's really nothing that there's, I don't see a lot of dirt on it. So I don't want to introduce anything I don't have to. I really think it just can be pressed. So I'm going to leave it as a 9.0 and indicate that it can just be pressed, but that's awesome. Okay, so <clears throat> a couple of really, really, uh, I think, great opportunities to get uh, high grade on some older books. Uh, I can't stop looking at this one. I need to move on to the rest of the books, but Black Panther number seven from 1977. Uh, I mean, even in a worst case, I think this one maxes out at a nine six, but this one could be a nine eight. Love it. Looks even better in my bag and board without all that scotch tape on it. Super cool. Okay, on to the next stack. Put those aside and focus on this one. This is She-Hulk, uh, Savage She-Hulk, number 20. Story by David Anthony Kraft, art by Mike Vosberg. Uh, great cover, love the cover. A uh, lot of white, uh, probably susceptible to a lot of dirt and damage. Um, there are some spine ticks on this one. Uh, so, you know, has that sort of 8.0 to 9.0 kind of look and feel, but um, this one had a lot of uh, hidden value and potential, again, because of the cover. Um, typically all white covers or all dark covers, all black covers, black ink, uh, color rub, all of that stuff. Um, the black and white covers are really the ones to, to look out for. Um, you could probably argue any cover. <laughs> it has the potential for color rub and damage, but it's just uh, with the white, you can just you typically can really, really see it. But uh, this one looks really strong, really colorful, very bright. Um, no real key here. 
Um, I kind of like with Moon Knight, I'm probably a little bit late to picking up She-Hulk back issues, but every now and then I grab a Savage She-Hulk uh, book that, um, it's a 25 issue run, her first solo series. I don't have her first appearance, I don't have issue one, so I figured I'll just get the rest. <laughs> so this is number 20 that I can add to that run. Okay, uh, this one back to back. Uh, I actually did get two copies of Spawn number nine. Speaking of uh, white backgrounds, uh, the copy that I have sent in, uh, I got a nine six, uh, and it's. I feel like all the books are like this. Uh, you can kind of even through the bag, you can see it. The color rub right there by the corner box, um, the character box rather. Uh, just that's what keeps these books from being a nine eight. Unfortunately. Um, yeah, I'm looking at this one as well. A little bit of color rub here. Not as much on this one, but it's up at the top there still is. Um, I don't know if that's something I would want to work on in terms of trying to get some of it off. There's even some over here. It's just like the, the never-ending color rub on this book. Uh, but I still feel like this one being the first appearance and first cover appearance of Angela, uh, who I think is coming to... The MCU, at some point, will she appear in Thor, Love and Thunder? There are rumors that she might. Will it be a minor character? I don't know. I feel like she's kind of too strong of a character at this point to just be kind of a one-and-done throwaway. Um, so she may potentially be saved for after Thor 4. Don't know. Still, um, the rights to this character probably more interesting than the character itself uh so i love that great spawn back issue mcfarland cover can't go wrong so uh and this is also just leftover fomo from me thinking i had a 9-8 candidate and i got a 9-6 so i keep grabbing these hoping one day to get that 9-8 candidate back to she hulk for a second this is sensational she hulk number two uh this one uh, I, I, there are a handful of issues that are considered to be keys. Uh, issue number one is, uh, the final issue is, um, and hey, not the first issue, grab the second issue. Uh, John Byrne, uh, here as well, story and art. Um, and a lot of, I think, what is not shown in the She-Hulk trailer for her show, I really think, uh, in the show, she's going to break the fourth wall and talk to the audience, which is what that whole sensational She-Hulk run is kind of all about here. And now alternating back to Spawn, we have Spawn 16. Uh, this was a book that I thought had really good value. Um, this is the first time Greg Capullo uh, does art for Spawn. He's a longtime collaborator with Todd McFarlane. Uh, it's also the first cameo appearance of Anti-Spawn later uh, renamed the Redeemer. I think in the next issue, there it's like the full appearance of the Redeemer, but first cameo. Uh, and again, Kupulo on the cover here, um, collaborating with McFarlane. I think that's a newsstand copy. I'll have to check. Maybe even... I, I just... I, they're both, I guess, technically newsstand. Sensational She-Hulk too. I'm just not... I'm not a good comic book collector when it comes to direct and newsstand. It's just not something I care about. Um, the only time I really care about it is when I'm cataloging these because I want to make sure that when I add them to my spreadsheet and I add it to cover price that I'm selecting either direct or new stand. But um, Spawn 16, really good value on that one. Uh, speaking of new stand, there we go. Thor 353. Uh, again, sort of the, the, the lighter color picking up dirt. This one looks pretty good. Uh, this would be great in a newsstand to be able to have this in a 9.8. Um, I don't see really many spine issues on this one, so this looks great. Uh, this is uh, written and uh, penciled by Walt Simonson. Uh, the Simonson Thor run is legendary. Um, I did order two of these, and this was one of the ones that were refunded. So a uh, little bit of a preview there. I paid about three bucks for this. Um, in Near Mint, and uh, kind of like the Burn Fantastic Four run, I'm trying to get all of the Simonson uh, Thor run. 
Okay, I'm thinking of my friend Clyde here with X-Men 191, and this is a really uh, strong reminder that I need to look at the book that he sent me and uh, prep that for sending into CGC as well. Um, so I grabbed uh, another copy of this. Uh, first appearance of Nimrod. Uh, if you read Hoxpox, you see that he's a major player in that. He came back a little bit in the last X-Men run. Um, I think he's just sort of an interesting character. Um, and uh, John Romita Jr. on cover art here with Vision and Colossus. So this is kind of a, I don't want to say it's an underrated key. I don't like those terms. But it is considered to be a key issue. It's his first appearance. Um, kind of wish he was on the cover. He does show up in several of the uh, the 190s X-Men. Uh, so I think that's the only thing really lacking from this book is not having Nimrod front and center there. Uh, but this, this book's like right in my wheelhouse, right when I was uh, collecting and reading as a young collector. Okay, the last book was the biggest book in the order. Um, and again, it's categorized as near mint. We opened up a couple of these and took a look at them, and clearly you can see they're not just home run 9.4 or above all day long. They do need a little bit of attention uh, in terms of uh, cleaning and pressing in order to get them up there. However, when I do see some of these books classified under near mint, uh, which, again, on Atomic Avenue, they have pretty wide ranges of grades to allow for um, just slight differences of opinion or judgment on grading. But when I see a book like this listed as near mint, um, it may be over fair market value, but I'm paying for that chance to get it in that higher grade and in that better quality and condition. So the last book is Thor 140. And I had my eye on this book for quite some time uh, from Professor's Comics, basically since I placed that first order. Um, this is the first appearance of Growing Man. He's on the cover as well. Um, 12 cent uh, Silver Age book, and it was listed as Near Mint. <clears throat> so it's hard to find these older books in Near Mint. I want to open this up and take a look at the condition just to kind of see really how close were we to getting in near mint and I hate to be negative but I, I know the book it's weird like I know the book's not near mint but yet I buy it anyway thinking that well maybe it could be even though I know it's not so right off the bat uh, there is a pretty major crease right there it's it's maybe an inch or two what's well, probably an inch and a half to two inch crease uh, going up and down here um, there are some color breaks along the spine there, but not bad. Uh, again, like if I'm just sort of taking a step back and not looking at maybe some of the other creasing, it looks right, and, and there's, the more I look, the more color breaking spine ticks I see one, the right surrounding the staples there, and then some other non-breaking ticks. So this is really more, a little bit of softening. This is more in line with that 9.0 that I was talking about earlier where it really kind of looks like my slabbed 9.0. Um, now, if I just open up the cover slightly here, uh, there's a little bit of a chipping and some things on the edge. Um, just slight discoloring, just slight tanning on the side as well. Uh, lots of creasing in here. Try and get it in the light for you. But in Thor's cape, there, there's also these little creases. There we go, right there. So, you know, maybe not quite the nine. Now we're now we're down to eight five, uh, possibly eight already. And then on the back, um, it's it's not bad, but again, some sort of cover page crunching that's happening in the middle there. Um, it's a little off white, not quite tan, but it's okay. Uh, a little bit of a color thing there. So it's, it's definitely probably down to maybe an eight because it, it's just slightly dirty on the back. But the back uh, spine doesn't look all that bad. I mean, again, Silver Age books look a lot worse than this, Like, but just like that. So now seven, five, eight. And then on the inside, I, are those white pages? I mean, 
that looks pretty cool. Uh, that's very exciting. That might, those might be considered white pages, I think. Uh, it, at worst, it's off white to white. But that looks, that looks pretty strong from the inside. So there's a lot of potential here. I think I'm probably going to leave it as an 8, as a very fine uh, and not uh, near mint, obviously. I, I think this is a really strong 8.0 copy. So I'm going to leave it 8.0, but I'm definitely going to mark it as um, a pressing candidate. I think that um, with a decent press, I can get a lot of the creasing out and maybe get it into that 9.0 range. So I feel pretty good about that. Now for this one, I'm going to put it in a, um, in a full back and I'm going to mark it 8.0. And I feel like I need to give it a clean, I feel like it, it, when it's not, I mean, this is supposed to be very, very white behind the Thor logo, behind Thor himself. And it's just, just slightly yellow. Just, it just has a little bit of dirt that I think I probably wouldn't take more than one pass at it just to give it a nice once over. Oh, gorgeous. Love it when it's rebagged and board, boarded like that. So uh, very happy with this, even though I knew it wasn't near mint. Uh, I'm st I still knew that these books had a lot of potential. So let's look at what I paid for these books. I'll play around with some of the grades and then compare the cost against those fair market values. Okay, here is that order that I placed with Professor's Comics on Atomic Avenue. I placed the order on May 28th. So here we can see the, the total for the order was $234.78. And uh, it was $21.03 to ship. Um, both Professor's Comics and Capco Comics, they charge for shipping. But again, to me, uh, now that I understand the, kind, the, the quality of books the professionalism with the speed with which they ship their orders out and how they pack them securely, it's worth it to me to pay the shipping. So what I do is I take the 2103 and distribute it across all of the books so that I have a total cost here of 234.78 that matches up with uh, what I was charged. Okay, so uh, for the raw value, uh, it is a loss of almost $61 here, uh, and this is basically due to that Thor 140. So you can see I paid $79.40 for it, but it has a fair market value of $32.80. So a pretty substantial loss, but again, as you go back in age and go through the eras, fair market value, I would say the grade underneath that tends to drop. So... The fair market value of a brand new release, I think I've always kind of said it's probably a 9.6. A fair market value of a Silver Age book, it's probably mid-grade, 4, 5, or 6, somewhere in there. So I take that into consideration, but I have to keep all of my analytics relative and simple. So I just say, yeah, it, I, I didn't get any deals, uh, so to speak, from the fair market value perspective. But um, when I show you what the value is when the book is graded, I think that's where the deal starts to come in. So uh, that really took care of um, the bulk of the loss. Um, here's the other big loser, so to speak, Daredevil 101. I thought I I paid a pretty good price for it, um, uh, $19.40, and it was in a VF Plus, and uh, the fair market value on that book is under $10. So Again, I'm looking at potential, you know, for grading a little bit how I look at Mile High Comics. Uh, some of these older books, it's really not intended for flipping. It's really more for cleaning, pressing, grading, and investment sake. Um, the Spawn number nine, interesting, uh, a $2 and a $3 loss. Um, I think he said one was a near mint minus and the other one was near mint. Uh, total cost, so the, the near mint minus, he knocked a dollar off the price on that one. Um, the Thor 353, I'm not sure which one he's, I think he must be saying the near mint minus is the $3 one he couldn't find. Um, I guess I'll be the judge of that when I grade these books. So I do have to make a little bit of adjustment. So I left both of the Thor 353s in here um, and I'll fix that uh, later on as I was not anticipating a canceled book and a refund. 
Um, any winners here? Anything positive? Uh, Savage She-Hulk 20 uh, cost me about $4. It's worth about 7 Let's see. And then Spawn 16 which again, I thought had pretty good value. Total cost of $3.90, and it is almost a $9 book uh, in a fair market value. So a nice little $5 gain there. Uh, again, Thor 53, they both would have been positive, but I only got one of the two. Uh, let me plug in the grade so that you can see. So I was targeting near mint, which is 9.4. And if I flip all of these books to 9.4, then the grades float in and the CGC value appears. And if I were to send all of the books that I felt had value slabbed in a 9.4, uh, which in this case is pretty much all of them to some degree, they're, they're all older books or they're, they're all... Uh, books that I think are worthy taking a chance on, on slabbing. Uh, it would have been a if I just blindly sent all of these books in and I thought that they were all near mint, which I know they're not, but if that was my thinking, then uh, my target CGC value is about $180 uh, of value added to my collection. That's after all of the fees and the shipping costs to send books to CGC and so forth. Uh, so again, this is why I make these decisions because yes, I'm going to it's, it's risky because from a fair market value raw book perspective, um, it's going to be a loss, and I'm aware of that when I place the order. However, the upside, uh, there's just too much potential. Um, these are all great books to add to the collection. There's a few that I'm chasing in high grade, so it made sense for me to go ahead and place this order. Now, what is the ceiling? What is this book, uh, or what is this order sort of max out at? So if I were able to, to clean and press all of these books or for, by some miracle, uh, they all turn to 9.8. Uh, we could see we're dealing with over $5,000 worth of comic books. In particular, carried again by Thor, uh, being a $2,000 book in a 9.8. Do I believe that I can get this book up to a 9.8 if I apply my skills with cleaning and pressing? I do not. It has too many color breaks. Um, I think I counted at least six, maybe seven, and then all the creasing on top of that. So I really do feel like that one probably caps out at, at maybe, maybe if I'm lucky, maybe it's a nine. Um, and so that book in a nine is $172. And that's probably more typical of, you know, I would say sort of value books or, or things like that, where um, you've probably made uh, an $80 purchase plus CGC fees and so forth. Um, and, and you can probably earn or add a little bit of value, about $60 to your collection. That, that's when you start to multiply that out by 5, 10, 25, 50 copies, you'd love to, to turn a $60 profit per book. Now, if I could squeeze a 9.2, let's see if that makes a difference um, slightly. So again, like it's not that big a deal for it to not be a 9.2 uh, if, it, if it is just going to be that 9.0. The other book I wanted to look at was 188. Uh, that is the Black Widow cover. In a 9.8, that, that book is $140. Um, I really think that that's, that's strong. Uh, 9.6, uh, it drops to 62, so it's kind of 9.8 or bust on that one. But uh, that one also has really good value. But you can see a lot of these have uh, $200 or more. That Thor, Thor 353. And a 9.8 right now is being reported by GPA as a $200 book. I spent roughly three to four dollars to acquire that book. Um, so this is these are the books. Uh, that first appearance at Nimrod, Clyde. I'm thinking about you. Um, total cost there $12.40. And a 9.8. That's a $250 book. Um, the one that's jumping out at the top. Unfortunately, that one is not a 9.8. Um, but it, if it were, it was $1,800. And again. I'm, why am I buying books that I know are not 9.8? Like, what's the point of showing this? These are the gaps. This is the potential. And where the rising tide raises all boats, as these 9.8 values continue to rise, it's going to continue to pull down the grades behind it. So I look at these. I look at the gap. Um, and also, and then it's just, it's also a little bit of a gamble, too. What if I got that book and it had a couple of creases in it and I could press it out and turn it into a 9.8, right? So there's there's the gamble, the potential, uh, the ceiling, the range. All of that is what I look for in these books. And uh, at the end of the day, 
Um, you know, I, I, these books are not going to show up in a 9.8. People are, the, the sellers are way more savvier than you think. There, there's no way that anybody is going to let 9.8 copies just float in raw. People are grading them and they know that. But if they see flaws at all, they may just say, I don't want to bother pressing. I don't want to bother, you know, maybe grading at that fine a level. Maybe I'll be more conservative with my grading. And they let books go that have that potential. So that's what I look for at this point. Because the days the days of unearthing 9.8s at flea markets and stuff like that, those, those are over. Everybody is aware of grading and, and so on. Um, we're in the age of, of potential and what other improvements could I make to the book? And also looking at, uh, you know, I keep talking about Thor 140, but like a book like this, um, this is a high grade. Like a 9.0 for a Silver Age is a high grade. It may not be the most valuable Thor book, but my theory, my ongoing working theory is as time passes, the older books will all be keys. And you start to see this too, where very slowly, like look at, Amazing Spider-Man to me, those early issues, that's the perfect example of what the, that, that series, that run is ahead of everything else. You could argue that Batman, maybe Detective Comics are kind of along the same lines or has the same theory like the, the earlier books, every single book is a key, but you're also like slipping into the golden age there. My point is that as some of the other series start to catch up with Amazing Spider-Man, and we look at a lot of these books, they're all going to end up being significant because there are going to be fewer of them around. Um, there are fewer of them in that um, high quality, high condition. And everyone has been so hyper-focused on keys that I think the issues between the keys or around the keys, as I like to say, those give you the best opportunity to acquire them. They're much cheaper. Um, and I think people are who are maybe exiting the hobby, they are just focused on maybe grading and selling their keys and letting the other books go raw. So I hope you enjoyed this unboxing. I appreciate you watching. Happy collecting and see you next time.